God in this, uh, in this psalm. And it goes like that. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Here David is calling out realizing that God has done so much for him. He crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Now when he's saying bless the Lord, he's, he's praising and sometimes if you find it difficult to get up in the morning, if you'll begin to praise the Lord, to offer thanksgiving, to count your blessings, it will amaze you how you will be able to get going in spite of all those creaking joints. <laughs> Hope you don't have too many of those. But he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and then he's saying, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, you know, the Lord does not forget very much, but he does forget the sins that we have confessed to him. You may have said to the Lord in your prayer sometime, do you remember that sin that I talked to you about before? And he would have to say, no, I don't remember it. Now, when somebody offends you, you may find it a little bit difficult to forget. I've heard people say, well, I can forgive him, but I can't forget it. Well, I'm not sure there has been complete forgiveness in that situation. But God does forget our confessed sin. That's the only thing he forgets. It says he forgives all our iniquity. Jesus hung on that cross to pay the price for all our sin. Sins of the past, sins of the present, and sins that we will yet commit. I hope they won't be too many, but because we are human, God knows that we are apt to sin. For the scripture says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if anyone says he doesn't sin, he has made God out to be a liar because of our human frame. But the fact that he forgives us of all our sin is worth shouting about. When we confess our sin, the scripture says in 1 John, he is faithful and just to forgive us all our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I shared that scripture in the Sunday school class this morning because they were talking about forgiveness. And I hope some of you are in the Sunday school classes because here you're learning the scriptures and you're in the Bible study groups that you have in your community, in your home or here at church, you are learning the scriptures and you are getting your faith matured and you're building your faith because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you want to be in every opportunity you can to expand your faith, especially of the scriptures. And the Sunday school teachers can encourage those young ones to memorize some of these important scriptures. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. I hope you're hearing this, because I'm going to ask you to share it at the end. (laughs) Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. There is no sin or sickness beyond God's healing touch. So when we throw ourselves upon his mercy and we trust him in faith, we know that he is able to heal all our diseases. We come before his presence with the idea that he is trustworthy and we can depend on him to bring us through. Now, he may not excuse us from all pain because Jesus suffered pain on that cruel cross. And sometimes pain can be therapeutic, believe it or not. It can help us to see what our roots are and help us to build character of strength that will help us to face more difficult situations that are coming down the road. For the scripture says, in this world we shall have tribulation. It will not be a bed of roses as you already know. Then he says, he redeems our life from destruction. That word redeems means to buy back. And I think a good illustration of it is in the book of Hosea, God tells Hosea to marry a prostitute named Gomer. And he said, I want you to marry her because it will show the people in your village and wherever you go that Israel is very much like your marriage. They have been unfaithful many times. And finally, Gomer ends up down at the slave market. And the Holy Spirit speaks to Hosea and says, you must go down there and buy her back. Can you imagine a family member sinking so low that they would end up on the slave market and then you would go and pay a price. You would redeem them. You would buy them back. They are already yours as a wife, but you would buy them back. And that's what God does for us. He pays the price to buy us back. Not that we deserve it, because in our flesh there's no good thing, but because of the price that he paid on Calvary's cross, he says to each one of us, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You belong to me. You're made in my image. I have put my Holy Spirit in you, and your body has become the temple of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if some of our young people who are experiencing abuse of alcohol and drugs, if they could understand that their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, would they be defacing their bodies in such horrible ways and putting all sorts of abusive drugs I was the alcohol and drug control officer at Fort Monroe for many years while I worked for the Army and the civil service. In fact, one of your choir members was my counterpart at Tradoc. He's gone to the Chesapeake now, Wally Hunt. You knew him because he was in this choir. The Chesapeake used to be the old Baptist home and he and some of our friends are over there. 
but the Lord bought us. He paid a price for us. And that youngster who says, oh, it's my body. I can do with it what I want. Not so. When you were brought to this altar to be christened or baptized or whatever, and you accepted your parents, accepted in your behalf that you were receiving the Holy Spirit. You no longer are on your own. Your life now is motivated by the Holy Spirit. It is infused with the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit no matter what road you take. And even when we go down to the slave market, he sends somebody to buy us back. We are redeemed from destruction. How many times have you come close to death and you have felt the rejuvenating power of the Holy Spirit bringing new life and strength into your body, mind, and spirit? He does redeem us from destruction. He crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. I think there are some of you here who are being crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies. I can ask some people in your family, and they say, Grandma or Aunt so-and-so or Uncle so-and-so is a bright, shining light in this household, in this family, in this church. There are certain people who have been somehow specially blessed with loving kindness and tender mercies. And do you know when the day comes when we draw our last breath and our spirit leaves this body and goes to be with the Lord and those that we've loved down through the years. Those who have never known God and have refused to know him will be called before the great judgment seat. It's called the great white throne and that's the judgment seat for unbelievers and the scripture says it's a fearful time because there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth now I don't know much about gnashing of teeth but I know that it will not be a happy time because Jesus told about Lazarus and the rich man who had gone to paradise and the rich man was tormented to such a point that he said, oh Lord, if you could just let Lazarus come over and put a drop of cool water on my parched tongue. There is a divide between those who believe and those who do not. I don't think anybody, I don't think it sends anybody to hell but I think that a lot of people choose to go that direction. And you don't have to wait till you die to know what hell is all about because I think you know some people right now who are experiencing an element of hell. Really, it's separation from God. And whenever you are separated from God for any reason, you're in a dangerous place. But the good news is that those of us who are believers, who have accepted Jesus as Savior, repented of sins and confessed our sins and have accepted the Holy Spirit in our lives, we will not stand before that great white throne judgment seat. We will stand before the judgment of rewards. And at that, he will say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. 
And he will give to us rewards, those of us who have trusted him, who have believed him, who have walked with him. St. Paul makes it clear. I've fought a good fight, I've kept the faith, and I've finished the course. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. I believe some of us will get a crown of righteousness on that great day. And some of us will get a crown of loving kindness and tender mercies. And I'm expecting to see you over there with a crown on your head. And I speak that for your benefit today, that he might crown you with loving kindness and tender mercies so that he will fill your mouth with good things so that your youth may be restored like the eagles. I'm so glad that our forefathers did not accept the turkey as our national bird. <laughs> I love to eat turkey at Thanksgiving and other times, but the turkey does not present a very victorious position. And I'm glad they accepted the eagle. And sometimes when you feel kind of weak and tired and lifeless, you can say, Lord, I want to mount up as an eagle and run and not be weary and walk and not faint. There's something about an eagle that makes a majestic picture. We have one in our apartment at the Chamberlain, a small one that's just an image of an eagle. But I understand that when turkeys and chickens and other animals see a storm coming, they quickly gather under something to get protection but that the eagle has a way of tipping its wings so that when the wind comes in all its fury, it lifts them above the storm so that they ride above the storm rather than being overwhelmed by the storm. Now, as a Christian, we should have eagle's wings. When the storms of life come, and you can count on them, they will come. That we can tip our spiritual wings in such a way that we are not crushed by the storm, that we are not running around like a chicken with its head cut off, that we are not acting like all of those other folks but we are strong in the Lord. And we are saying, Lord, we know that you're not bringing anything against us that we cannot stand. You have promised that in your word. We don't know why this is happening, but we know that it's not happening without your knowledge because you know what we can stand. St. Paul said, this thorn in the flesh that has troubled me so, I have prayed three times for it to be removed. And the Holy Spirit said to me, my grace is sufficient. Can you take the storms that will surely be coming and tip your spiritual wings in such a capacity that it will lift you above the storm and you will come out victorious.
I close with this. John Wesley, the founder of our Methodist Church, when he came to Georgia to convert the Indians, he didn't have much success. He didn't get along very well with Governor Oglethorpe's daughter, Priscilla. And he denied Priscilla the communion. And the governor was not pleased about that. Soon he was on the boat back to England. And a great storm came up. And everybody was running around like a chicken with the head cut off. But there was a little group of Moravians on that ship. And they were over there in one corner praying and singing hymns. They had tipped their spiritual wings to ride above the storm. John Wesley was given that vision of those Moravians to his heart. And when he got back to England later, 1724, May 24th, 1738, he went to a little meeting house on Aldersgate Street where a lay person was reading from Luther's preface to the Book of Romans. And he said, I felt my heart was strangely warmed. And I did accept Christ as my Savior and him alone for my salvation. Now this happened to John Wesley and he had been preaching for years. Not with much success, however. But now he has been infused with the Holy Spirit, so that he said, I know without a shadow of a doubt that Christ, that I've accepted Christ as my Savior and him alone for my salvation. And after that, his ministry began to blossom. So we do have that blessed assurance that Fanny Crosby talks about in her hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, for a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit and washed in his blood. She was blind, but she had more vision than some of us who have 2020. She saw in the spirit that God was the only hope for her. And I pray that today you will consider this wonderful scripture. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, satisfieth you with good things so that you can mount up with wings like the eagle. So mote it be. Amen.